everyone, how's everybody doing? <clears throat> I hope you're doing fine. I'm doing okay, so that's good. Today we're going to talk about extinction, the extinction of man. So I hope I'm dressed <laughs> appropriately, right, for the occasion. Okay, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about, I'll give you a quick outline here. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about prophets of doom, some of the uh, prophets that we've had throughout time. I'm going to do a little brief review of them. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask an uh, important question, whether extinction is a part of science. Should we be discussing, this is rational science, should we be discussing extinction at all? I mean, is this a topic that concerns science? Extinction 101 versus 102, I'll get on that uh, a little well, put you up to date on that. Uh, past extinctions, we need to know a little bit of what happened in the past. And uh, then we got to figure out what the mechanism for man's extinction is going to be, if there's ever going to be an extinction of the human race. Okay, so that in a nutshell is what I'm going to cover. Okay, and let's begin with the prophets. You know, and uh, here's a poll that they ran. Uh, I got this out of the Wikipedia. And uh, 2012, 20 countries, 14% of people believe the world will end in their lifetime. I thought that was a big number. I can't find hardly <laughs> anybody who thinks that it's going to end in, within their lifetime. But, yeah, I guess uh, I'm one of those, even though I, didn't, I was not included in the poll. 6% <laughs> of people in France and 22 in the United States. So apparently there's more people in the United States that believe the world's going to end or within their lifetime. More pessimistic, maybe? More realistic? Which one? Uh, in the UK, 2015, 23% apocalypse likely to occur in their lifetime compared to 10% of experts from the Global Challenges Foundation. So here you have the experts who study extinctions. They only 10% of them believe that there's going to be an extinction, whereas 23% of the population in uh, the UK has been polled to think that it's going to happen within their lifetime. What are the... Um, Cause it, well, uh, belief in the apocalypse, lower rate of education, lower incomes, and in those under 35. Those are the people who believe that, uh, well, I don't know if apocalypse refers to the biblical version or whether it's just going to happen. If it's about going to happen, I don't think it qualifies for those under 35. <laughs> Not anymore, but maybe I qualify for the lower rate of education. <laughs> Uh, general public, what are the causes? Uh, nuclear war. Everybody thinks of nuclear war. We're going to destroy each other. Okay, that's, I think, the number one probably, or it's up there with the, with the best of them, right? Another one could be climate change. Uh, experts, they believe it's going to be artificial intelligence. We're going to create AIs, uh, you know, some monster, some Frankenstein, and he's going to wipe us out, okay? That's what the experts say. Um, an experiment run amok. 3% um, of UK and 16% of US believe in uh, biblical uh, causes or uh, prophecies. Uh, the Last Judgment, right? Um, Revelation, etc., right? One to two to three percent in the U.S. and U.K. that zombies <laughs> and aliens are going to cause our extinction. Zombies, okay? People believe. I think they've been watching too much TV. That's what I think. <laughs> okay. Um, let me get organized here a little bit. Give me a second. Yeah. Uh, here are some of the prophets in the past, from like the year zero to the year, um, what is it, the end of the 19th century. Okay, these are different prophets and institutions, organizations that predicted the end of man. Okay, you can see there's quite a few of them. And uh, all these people, primarily, all these people thought the extinction was going to be due for, uh, um, as a result of biblical reasons. Okay, so they, they simply try to interpret the Bible, and, um, and that's what they 
projected onto the future, okay? And usually they projected it for the next hundred years or even imminent and that sort of thing, okay? So they, they had this idea that uh, the Bible was telling them something, that there was a prediction in there. Um, 20th century, here's a list of those people, and now we start to change a little bit. There's not only biblical reasons included in uh, among these people, but now since we have more information about the universe, people are thinking now in more um, uh, uh, cosmic terms, uh, specifically accidents, you know, uh, cosmic accidents of some kind. And um, in the 21st century, this is the last 20 years, uh, the ones on the left, uh, they think that it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, that it's going to happen within our lifetime, probably. Uh, the ones on the right, you have those uh, who say, well, it's going to happen in the 21st century. And others say it's going to happen in uh, anywhere from the 22nd to the 23rd century. And yet others uh, propose that it's going to happen, you know, maybe in 100 million years, 900 uh, million years, or who knows when. And everyone, everyone, everyone is thinking along the same lines. They're all saying, look, it's going to be a global catas catastrophic uh, accident, uh, some catastrophe of some kind. So everybody's thinking in terms of catastrophes. They can't think of anything else. And um, here you have a, a listing. Let me get myself back in here. Here you have a listing of, um, of um, some of the biblical causes first. Uh, if you go to the good book, you'll find Apocalypse, Millennium, uh, Antichrist. He's going to come back. <laughs> or, or he's just never left, I guess. Christ will come back. Okay. No uh, level type flood. You know, uh, God reigns 40 days and 40 nights, just floods the planet. Water world, something like that. Planetary alignment, some people, that's where the astrologers come in. They say, look, you got this planetary alignment, that's the end of us, for whatever reason, okay? War, okay, war's been around for a while. People, when they saw war and disease, they always thought also that it could be the end of the world. Judgment Day, obviously, uh, Jesus, God, everybody, the devil, everyone comes over and says, look, it's it's over for you guys. We're going we're gonna to take some north and others south. <laughs> Uh, biblical interpretation, years since creation, they say, oh, 6,000 years after the day of creation, that's when it's going to happen simply because the Bible says so, or that's the interpretation. And you had people also uh, talking about it in the second millennium, and again, for biblical reasons, that the second coming of Christ and that sort of thing. Okay, So people are thinking along those lines, either catastrophic accidents, the people you could call scientists and then the other people who believe in biblical prophecies essentially that's what it comes down to uh and here are the catastrophists catastrophists <laughs> uh what do they propose well uh, since the 14th century since the black death so many people died uh people are thinking about the you know diseases and they probably happened even before then um i'm sure that if you go to the age of the romans you had uh um smallpox ravaged towns and cities they probably thought it was the end of the world as well these are some of the documented things that we find out there comet earthquake nuclear holocaust that's uh one of the number ones in the 20th century and still is okay evil aliens <laughs> they're gonna invade us okay they're already here <laughs> asteroid hits the earth okay uh, i guess people in the past never thought about the uh, rock destroying the earth ever since we've located some of these rocks out there that came into the popular uh, folklore as well you know um supernova gamma ray uh, again you have to know a little more about the universe to be able to come up with these ideas and people in the past didn't have this pandemic that's been around climate change that's a new one very powerful one a lot of people uh, making the uh, uh, talk uh, circuits uh, talking about climate change and how we have to stop destroying the environment that sort of thing increasing solar brightness co2 starvation ai's again you know peak oil some people say we're gonna run out of oil and then we're all dead for whatever reason they never explain the mechanism they just say peak oil when it's over 
we don't have energy to run the world and that's it that's all they say how we're gonna die we don't know we don't have the mechanism the step-by-step -step mechanism running out of water uh, running out of arable land volcanoes been popular all the way since the Permian everybody says you know Permian uh, synapsids died because of volcanoes volcanic activity in fact some propose that even for the Cretaceous um, fewer children we're going to have fewer children and we are having fewer children proportionally to to our total population so we're not growing as well uh, as much how that's going to end up in extinction i guess they're saying well if we keep having less and less and less and less people less kids right uh, eventually it's going to whittle down to no no population at all i guess that's what the in the back of their minds black hole cia experiment run amok <laughs> ET's post-humanism, you know, uh, we're going to uh, upload our souls onto the internet, something uh, that is very similar to what they had in the old days where you go to heaven, well, this is more or less internet heaven, you know, you upload your soul, <laughs> you don't need your body anymore, that sort of thing, okay, um, what do I propose, why am I different than all these people, I mean, you could say, well, Bill, all you're doing is just, you're just another uh, chicken little out there uh, saying, uh, you know, the sky is falling, you know. We've heard that before. We, we've seen it over and over again. Well, what you won't find it anywhere, uh, Wikipedia, wherever you go, you'll, you won't find my theory whatsoever. you got to come here because you won't see it anywhere else. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And so here are my two proposals. I'm saying uh, we have what is called a mass extinction and a background extinction. What is a mass extinction? I define it as the disappearance of a food change, uh, chain. Um, we, I uh, highlighted food, and that gives you an idea where I'm going with this. I'm saying we're, uh, since I say that humans will die because of, uh, in a mass extinction, it's going to be because of food, something related to food, okay? And I'm saying that's how mass extinctions happened in the past. So I'm projecting that to the future. And background extinction, I don't think we're going to die in a background extinction. Background extinction is the disappearance of a single species, meaning we disappear all alone and all the other animals continue. Like in the case of Neanderthal, I don't think that's going to happen to us. Now, we're going to die in a mass extinction. We're going to die in the extinction of the mammals. All mammals will die with us. Okay, we're going to take them down with us. We're going to take them to heaven. Okay, and uh, so that's, in a nutshell, what I'm proposing. And uh, what this takes us to two kinds of people today, essentially, all these notions that people have out there. You have um, the people who think that we're never going to die. Uh, usually those are biblical people in general, and they think that somehow God designated us as the gardener of Eden. And so... Uh, we're kind of like gods ourselves so we're immortal we live forever and that's because god chose we're the chosen ones we're the chosen animal the chosen mammal so to speak right and uh we have intelligence that's that's what he gave us god gave us this intelligence so you know um we're going to use it and uh again we were created to take care of the garden and all the animals are subservient to us that they were made for our use either to eat or to have, watch them at the circus or whatever and then there's the other people who say well humans will go extinct someday you know like way some in the future like I, I don't have to worry about it you know because it's gonna happen sometime in the future and so they put it off it's, it's like it's not gonna happen today because if you ask anyone who says it's gonna happen in a few months first they'll say probably it's not gonna happen and then the, they won't have a mechanism anyway. They can't give you a mechanism for why it's going to happen in one year, in two years, in five years. Okay, so it's like, it's just their opinion. They just say, maybe they might have a biblical reason or maybe a catastrophic re reason. They might say, well, the comet's going to hit the earth or there's going to be a supernova. Oh well, yeah, maybe there won't be. <laughs> and then what, we live forever? So that's, that's more or less uh, the argument there. Okay, um... Where does this take us? First, uh, we're going to decide whether 
extinction is a part of science. Is do we need uh, extinction as part of science? I mean, is is it a part of science? Does it have anything to do with science? Well, uh, you know, uh, we define uh, science as explanations, rational explanations. Well, you can only explain something that's happened, a phenomenon that's already occurred. So the question is, you know, the as far as I know, the <laughs> extinction of humans has not happened yet. So if it has not happened yet, there's nothing to explain. And if there's nothing to explain, well, how can it be a part of science? So we have to put it in the proper context. What's the context? The context is that we're going to explain not human extinction. We're going to explain extinction. We're going to have a mechanism for extinction. Specifically, I'm going to deal with mass extinction. And we do have those that have happened in the past. There's uh, especially, you know, the five major extinctions, and that's what we have to explain. How did those animals die? Why did they disappear? What happened to them? So we're going to explain, first and foremost, uh, past extinctions, consummated extinctions. And then what we're going to do, we're going to extrapolate that to man. That's the idea here. And, you know, again, you're saying, because I had a discussion the other day with uh, one of my sons, my youngest son, and uh, we don't look see eye to eye on this issue. And uh, he says that if you project it to the future, you're not talking about science anymore because now you're talking about something that hasn't happened. That's his argument. My argument is that what I'm what I'm proposing is that we cannot avoid extinction, like you know the dinosaurs or the synapsids or the uh, archosaurs. None of those could avoid extinction. So I'm saying it's an inevitable thing, inevitable thing that will happen. And so I have to explain why it will happen and why it's unavoidable, why we can't do anything about it. That's how I say it fits into science, because I'm explaining, on the one hand, past extinctions. I'm confirming them by saying, look, if man, with all his intelligence, cannot avoid this same mechanism that killed all species in the past, then that means, first, we, in a way, we have a little assurance that that's probably what happened in the past. That's one issue, but that's a question of belief. But the other one is that if we can't do anything about it, we can com can't come up with an antidote, that means that it's going to happen to us also. So it's like if we're looking at it from the future and say, look, humans have died because they could not avoid death. And this is the reason. This is what will cause them to go extinct and they can't do anything about it. That's how I put it into science. Okay, that's, that's the logic. That's the rationale. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, I'm saying it is part of science under those, under that context. And uh, so again, I don't think it's a prediction in that sense. I'm not saying, and I, I have never done so, saying, look, uh, humans will, dis the last human will die on the 5th of May of uh, the year 2030. No, uh, I'm not an astrologer. I don't have that kind of information. I don't purport to have that kind of information, which is a lot of what all these previous uh, prophets uh, always came up with. They said, oh, the, according to the Bible, if I do my calculations right, this is the exact date of the extinction of man. And they had no reason, no, no, uh, other than the coming of Christ. That's it. And he's coming down that day and he's taking everybody out. That's it. So, so it was an issue of faith. Here I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about a mechanism I'm saying we cannot avoid. When exactly it will happen, I have no idea. All I can do is, with my own gut feeling, say, well, it might happen sooner, it might happen later. Okay, that's all I can say. And again, that's my belief. Right here, I'm only concerned about the mechanism. Okay, what is going to cause it and why we cannot avoid it. Those are the two issues I'm going to concentrate on. Okay, um, we had, in our discussion with my son, uh, we said the only guaranteed prediction is death. Every prediction that can be guaranteed out there is somehow related to death, like the death of a star, if, if we're going to talk about the death of a star, the end point of its cycle. So only we can only say that all cycles end, except, of course, 
under the rope model, you know, the, the universe, okay? And um, before I continue with that, we, I got to clarify that we must explain uh, Extinction 101 before we uh, begin attacking Extinction 102. A lot of people like to put comments and ask questions, and they go directly to 102. No way. At least I'm not going to pay attention to any of those questions or comments. If you want to come into Extinction, you got to go to Extinction 101. What's Extinction 101? Past animals. We have to explain how the past animals died first. You got to tell me how you think the dinosaurs died, how the Permian synapses, how the uh, uh, Triassic uh, archosaurs, or whatever. You got to tell me how the animals in the past died. If you cannot tell, if you don't have a foolproof mechanism for how they died, you know nothing about extinction, much less can you talk about human extinction, which is a subset. So, uh, again, uh, whatever I say today, you got to go to Extinction 101 first, okay? At least from my point of view, I'm, I'm going to ignore all comments or, or questions that go directly to man. I don't care about man. I'm talking about extinction. If you don't know anything about extinction, you know nothing about the extinction of man. Period. We're done, okay? So that's the way I, I'm going to handle that, okay? So be aware. If you want to put a comment, please begin by saying how past ex uh, extinctions happen, how animals in the past died. Okay, um, here's the uh, um, relativistic version of, um, of the future, okay? And they say uh, there's been a, a Big Bang, okay, and that goes on forever, I guess. Well, not true. Now they have this notion that after the Big Bang, uh, all matter just keeps uh, bloating away, okay, just uh, separates, and eventually it turns into something that looks like this. Here it comes. Give it a second. Okay, you have this ball that's expanding, uh, I guess expanding through space. <laughs> Uh, the balloon is expanding, okay? That's the uh, notion that relative, uh, mathematical physics in general believes in. All the mathematical physics physicists believe in this kind of thing. There's going to be simply a, a continuation of the explosion that began almost 14 billion years ago. It's going to expand until everything becomes so um, light. In other words, there's no density. And... Uh, it's a rare, uh, rare uh, universe where you see very little matter uh, per volume, okay? And so uh, we just kind of whittle away or disappear into nothingness. That's the notion they have. Uh, no, under the rope model, we have a totally different version. It's, uh, we have a single closed loop thread in all space. That's all there is. And this thread is what turns into everything. You know, it turns into um, atoms and the ropes that interconnect all atoms. Atoms cannot convert into empty space. Empty space cannot convert into atoms. Therefore, the universe has always been there and will always be there when we're gone. Okay? So uh, there is no conversion of matter into nothing, which is what these people are proposing. But then they define nothing as made of particles, as we discussed last time. So their argument is to totally irrelevant. I mean, until they can tell us what nothing is, what space is, and uh, hopefully it's not made of particles. <laughs> because if it's made of particles, you can't say it turned into nothing. That sounds a lot like something. And the only issue there is, you know, what contours each particle. We're done. You know, that, that, they, if they can't answer that question, they don't have a theory. Okay. Um, so let's go with the extinction. What is it that we have to explain as far as past extinctions? Extinction 101, right? Okay, we got that? Okay, this is what we got to explain. Okay. <clears throat> now, you may not agree with this. You may say, well, where did they get this? Uh, what we have here is a graph of uh, millions of years. On the bottom, you can see that. And you have the Ordovician, the Silurian, uh, uh, Devonian, Carboniferous, etc. You have all these different eras. Okay, ages, and uh, those are the big five extinctions. How did they come up with this? Well, the paleontologists go into the rock and they find different layers, and they say, well, this layer is a million years old, this one is 10 million years old, this one's 100 million years old, and so on, because that's how long it takes for rock formation. Within those layers, they find bones, 
And they said, oh, look, throughout this period, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 million years, we had this animal, and suddenly it disappeared. We don't find its bones anymore. And, uh, and for a mass extinction, you find that a whole family, a whole order disappeared. Suddenly, a whole bunch of animals disappeared. What I call um, a, um, a food chain. Okay, that's where I get the notion of a food chain. What disappears in a mass extinction is an entire food chain. And the one that runs parallel to it, usually the smaller animals, they don't know what's going on. Suddenly, the big guys are gone. That's essentially uh, what a mass extinction is. And these are the five most important ones, but as you can see, there are other uh, peaks there. So you gotta explain a mass extinction in general. What is causing these periodic mass extinctions? That's the question we wanna address. And that's the first one we gotta answer, because if we find a cookie cutter, we can apply it to man and say, oh, if this animal died because of this, and this one also died because of that, and this other one died because of this, can we escape that same mechanism? See what I'm saying? That's, that's the notion that I'm going to talk about. Okay, and that's the one I'm going to propose. Okay, uh, so what do I propose? Well, I propose this. I propose that, you know, throughout history, uh, life, history of life on Earth, right? We had different land plants, major uh, categories of plants. Uh, we went from the bryophytes to the pterodites, uh, ter uh, ter uh, ter pteridophytes to uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms that we have today. And uh, each one of these groups dominated the landscape during millions of years. And then they gave way and some other uh, type of plant took over. Like in the case of the ferns, you know, they dominated the landscape uh, throughout the uh, Permian. And then uh, in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, uh, we have the gymnosperms take over, primarily the cycads first and with the ginkgos, and eventually the conifers. So th this is the trend that we see uh, in the rock. Okay, this, this is uh, the varieties we find inside the layers of rock and also the quantities we find within the layer of rock. And as we reach towards the end, well, we see that uh, the angiosperms begin to displace the, the gymnosperms. So what am I saying? I'm saying each era was dominated by, big area, right? Was dominated by a certain type of plant. And what do you think would happen if, um, if the plant suddenly disappears? Not suddenly, but gradually disappears. What, what would happen to the animals that forged a uh, long-term relationship with these plants? Well, you would think that their numbers would be decreasing, 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 and at some point, they're gone. The animals are gone, the, the plants continue a little further, and then they're gone too because they're displaced by more modern plants or new plants that Mother Nature invents and, and spawns, okay? Okay, here's another vision of that same thing, okay? And again, you can see that breaking them down in big chunks so that we get the big picture. That's the point of this. And you can see we have the age of ferns, again, around the Carboniferous, Permian, etc. And they continued, like we had seed ferns all the way to uh, at least the Jurassic, I think. And um, eventually these uh, ferns disappear and they were pushed aside by the conifers, okay? Uh, just uh, different families of conifers. They dot the landscape. There were no grasses at the time. And about maybe 150 million years ago, that's when the flowering plants started muscling aside the conifers, okay? So as these trends uh, made their way, the animals that forged relationships with those plants, with those major categories, I think they disappeared as well. One of the arguments people raise is they say, well, you know, uh, animals will switch foods. Instead of eating this, they'll eat that. Well, I don't know. Um, take a rabbit. Uh, you give him lettuce, he'll eat it. He'll eat some grass. Uh, they'll eat these things. Uh, you give them ferns, and they don't eat. They don't eat that. In fact, I think it kills them. And if you give them pine leaves, they don't eat that either. And they can't switch overnight and say any more than you can. I mean, for that matter, do it with yourself. You eat uh, lettuce, right? Uh, 
can you go in there and uh, replace that with pine leaves, pine uh, bristles, or pine cones? Can you switch your diet like that? Is your stomach ready to receive that new plant? I mean, plants are plants are plants, right? I mean, what the hell? Does it matter? No, it does matter. And uh, what I'm saying here is that if you have the conifers displace the ferns and the dinosaurs are feeding on conifers in general, all types of conifers, and they radiate together with these conifers, as the conifers eventually come to an end, in other words, they start becoming fewer and fewer and fewer, not only in number, but also in variety, well, you have fewer niches for the dinosaurs to radiate and they start coming down as well you know some species start vanishing here and there that's the background extinction rate and eventually there's a moment where there's a collapse a sudden uh relative relative um swift geological geologically speaking right collapse it suddenly you know dawns on them that they cannot switch at the last moment to other foods first of all because they've been Gradually, uh, gradually been adjusting their numbers to the available food supply. And there's no need to change their food as this process is happening. They just adjust their numbers to the dwindling food supply. That's all they do. It's not like, you know, the food disappears all of a sudden. No, the, the plants uh, are disappearing. They're being muscled aside by new plants. And the animals that are in this island eating this type of food all they see is a shrinking island and they just adjust their numbers to the shrinking island that's it now why do plants disappear climate change maybe uh, maybe the other plants are displacing them they're muscling them aside uh, no the reason plants disappear and again I give this uh, this uh, little uh, vision you go back to the Cambrian 542 million years ago, okay? And you look ahead, okay? You can predict now because we know what happened. So now you can kind of predict from the Cambrian starting line looking forward, okay? We're assuming the Cambrian is essentially when the animals came to be. Apparently, they, they were already in the pre-Cambrian, but that's academic. Uh, you look ahead. What do you expect? Well, you expect plants to die, big orders, big chunks of uh, types of plants, right? You expect them to die periodically because that's what happened. Why did it happen? Was it because they were displaced? Well, I think there's a more important or more fundamental reason, and that is that plants undergo a cycle of from birth to death, just like any other living entity. And uh, what happens throughout this time they lose first their genetic diversity and towards the end of the plant's life, near the end of these orders, right? Uh, what happens is their population pyramid overturns, okay? They live longer, okay? They have fewer offspring, okay? They lay out fewer seeds, okay? And eventually they whittle out. You can find some examples like in the redwoods in California they uh, don't grow by seeds anymore. In fact, they put out very few seeds that are actually worth anything. No, they grow by, um, by um, you know, plant, the, the tree dies. It's called vegetative growth. And another uh, clone comes out of that tree. So a lot of these plants grow these, these, uh, this way today. And I think that's how you can spot how old those plants are by seeing how many of them have vegetative growth versus those plants that have seed growth that grow as a result of seed and uh, pollination and etc. Okay, So plants uh, are expected to die. They have their cycle, their long-term cycle. They live a lot longer than animals for sure. And uh, as these plants follow this cycle, eventually they come to a dead end, which is when their population pyramid overturns and their genetic diversity disappears, okay? And so this is, this is where I'm going with that. That's my, the theory that I'm proposing, okay? And um, here's another vision of that, not so much with plants, but here we have what happens in the seas, okay? This is a big picture that I propose 
for what's happening in the seas, okay? And again, what you see that in the Paleozoic, uh, Paleozoic uh, it was uh, governed by the trilobites. Uh, when you go to Mesozoic, uh, you've got the uh, ammonites. This is the age of ammonites. And today, ever since the mammals came around, what we see in the seas, we see the age of krill. Okay, and the krill are now dying. We have uh, plankton dying on us uh, massively. We have less plankton out there. You can check the articles that are coming out. And krill eats plankton, so do whales. Uh, they are filter feeders. And um, the plankton are dying. Um, krill is dying. Uh, you have uh, fewer and fewer krill. And that's the bottom of the food chain. And so when the bottom of the food chain disappeared at the end of the Paleozoic, which was the end of the Permian, uh, we had all these animals die in the seas. And the uh, new that niche was taken over by the ammonites essentially okay so uh, there, there's always some crossover the ammonites took over that niche they started diversifying growing in numbers etc and essentially the mosasaurs you know they ate <laughs> ammonites and guess what uh, towards the end the plankton disappeared a lot of the plankton diatoms uh foraminifera uh, disappeared at the end of the uh, cretaceous and so did some of these uh, fil uh, these uh probably filter feeders, right, like uh, the ammonites. And that was the bottom of the food chain. That's what the uh, Mosasaurs ate. And some of these guys were big, you know. Uh, that's why I put the, a big ammonite there, because some of them were like six feet tall. <laughs> so uh, six feet radius, okay, um, um, sorry, uh, diameter. So uh, some of these ammonites, though, I think they found some in Canada, just gigantic ammonites. And so they're not like little... Uh, bugs there crawling on the ground. No, they were monsters. Some of them were monsters. And uh, Mosasaurs ate some of, the, at least the uh, mid-sized ones that ended up the Cretaceous. So uh, I'm saying that it all has to do with the food chain. Food chain disappears, that's a mass extinction. Okay. okay um, so uh, how do we go to humans with all this? I'm saying humans are going to die because of food. And so let's get started on humans. Remember, you got to do Extinction 101 first. Then we can get to what we're going to do now, which is Extinction 102. That's special. That's human extinction. And again, it's a projection for the future based on the idea that we cannot avoid the same mechanism that all these animals in the past could not avoid. Even if they had technology and intelligence, they wouldn't have been able to avoid it. And that's what we have today. We have foresight. We have intelligence, we have technology. None of those are antidotes to what I'm going to propose, which is the collapse of our economy. Okay, So uh, here we start. We start by saying that the world population, this is our global population, human population, has been steadily dropping. The growth rates have been steadily dropping since 1963. That was the last time we had, what, I think it was 2.3, 2.2 or 2.3. Uh, growth rate and since then it's been steadily dropping the steadily is crucial here we had for example in the uh, 14th century we had the bubonic plague wiped out maybe a third to a uh, half of the population of Europe those are the numbers that are kicked around uh, a lot of that information is taken from the little towns and cities and they go to the books how many people died and they get an idea that a lot of people died in those days that was the bubonic plague black death etc and uh, population recovered. It took like really two, <laughs> like 200 years to, work to recover. But the population recovered despite the fact that so many people died. And why? Because we were still young. We were a young species. Today, we are an old species, very old species. And you say, Bill, you're crazy. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean an old species? We were young. We were only, what, 200, 300,000 years old, right? Uh, Mother Nature doesn't count youth by how many times the Earth goes around the sun. Not for this kind of thing. Not for species. For species, it goes in a different direction. For species, Mother Nature looks at how much genetic diversity you have. And we have have essentially lost all our genetic diversity. We are all clones, essentially, uh, or getting there very quickly. Uh, if you take a Japanese, you take an African, you take a Russian, you take a South American, North American, Australian, you check their DNA, 
we are clones, essentially. Anyone who you marry is, uh, from a genetic point of view, either your sister or your brother. Doesn't matter if it's a different so-called race. Why? Because our grandparents, our great-grandparents, went through the same sifting process, specifically diseases. We all, whether you were in Japan, in China, in India, wherever you were, it doesn't matter, your great-grandfathers were able to overcome, uh, especially the childhood diseases that killed half of the children born. They killed them before the age of five. And here now all these kids could grow up they were not dead anymore uh, and have children of their own. And so that's how the population started growing. Especially in the 19th century, that's when the human population took a big jump and it continued all the way until 1963. And after that, no, now we're declining. Uh, we have fewer kids for many different reasons. I'm not going to go through all of them, but we are declining, no doubt about it. We're, we're growing at a slower, we're still growing, but growing at a slower rate. That's the point, okay? So our curve is, you know, like concave. It's, it's getting to that asymptote, okay, to that straight line. We're going to reach a plateau, and from then on, it's going to be downhill. And we only have three possibilities after that. If we go, continue going up, we go straight ahead, more or less up and down, stay stable, you know, uh, for just give you a number, 9 billion people on the planet, and we uh, oscillate around 9 billion, sometimes more, sometimes less, but always around there. Or we go south, we go down to extinction. And I'm saying we go down to extinction, not only that we will go down, but we will go down swiftly, vertically, almost. Okay, so it's not going to be a, a slow decline. No, because uh, what's going to take over is economics. It's going to overrule uh, our slow descent into what is known as a background extinction. We would die like, for example, the Neanderthals or Woolly, which died in background extinctions. We won't die that way. We, we go out with a bang. Okay, that's my point of view. I'm going to, in other words, it's a geologically sudden extinction. And with us will go all the mammals. Okay, um, so... Uh, here are uh, a little evidence, persuade you, convince you, a little religion on uh, a fact uh, that is that we don't have that much genetic diversity among the human race as compared to other animals at least. And here you have two statements, one from the Wikipedia says the genetic differences among human groups are relatively small. And then here we have a society, a group, an association that does a little studying Okay, uh, on the subject matter in genetics, so human genetic diversity is substantially lower than that of many other species, including our nearest evolutionary relative, the chimpanzee. Remember, chimpanzee, there's very few of them on the planet. And they live in these uh, groups. Uh, they're called troops. You go to a troop, maybe a hundred chimps, and they're like, you know, uh, I guess they have sex among each other. They have more genetic diversity the entire, than the entire human race. You say, how can that possibly be? These guys are located, they, they have sex among themselves, and they have more genetic diversity than the entire human race. Almost 8 billion people on different parts of the world with different climates, different environments. How can that possibly be? And again, it's that we, um, we got rid of all our genetic diversity through inner, inner, inbreeding. We've had a successful life, and we've conquered diseases, so we essentially are all clones today. That's essentially my argument. And uh, here's a famous case of Jan Calhoun. Uh, he, had, he put some uh, mice in a, uh, closed, in a little uh, small room, essentially, and uh, he let them grow. He, he put four pairs of mice. That's all, four pairs, four couples. And each one got his girl, each one of the uh, male mice, he got his own girl. They formed their little um, family, and the family started growing. Uh, in a few months, they had 2,000 mice in there. All came from the same four uh, uh, fathers, grandfathers, right? And eventually the... Uh, the colony ended up in extinction. He, they were given all the food they wanted, all the water. They had no diseases, no predators. And they turned the corner and they all went down 
and ended up in extinction. And he did this at least 25 times. This is uh, Utopian Universe number 25. I don't know if it was his last one, but he, uh, from 1947 to 1970s, early 1970s, he did a total, I think, of 25 experiments, first with rats and then with mice. All of them ended up in the same way. Okay? Besides the fact that the uh, rats and mice went nuts, and he's probably one of the first person to uh, produce homosexuality in the lab. Uh, a lot of the uh, mice and a lot of the rats became homosexual towards the end. Sounds like he's describing our society in great measure. So you should look up John Calhoun and his experiments. Okay, He was a psychologist. Okay, uh, yesterday uh, night I was watching uh, Morgan Freeman and uh, something came up which <laughs> got my attention. I said, I'm going to use this uh, tomorrow. And... Um, Morgan Freeman was looking into God, the existence of God. He's doing, he did a research on that, and I'm watching that to find out uh, what he's got to say about God. And it's an interesting thing that he goes to the Middle East, and he goes see this lady who's an expert at her subject, apparently, and uh, she talks about these monks that still try to imitate um, Jesus Christ. And they go to the desert, and they subject themselves to starvation you know essentially for five days they don't eat and so uh morgan freeman asked well why did they do that i mean why why, why do you want to punish yourself like that and she says because they they want to take themselves to the limit okay and this is their discussion okay so morgan freeman says uh the monks living here today put themselves through the same temptation jesus faced as their own test of faith, they venture out to the nearby caves and fast for five days a week. So he asked the lady, why fasting? And she says, fasting is getting yourself to a point of crisis. Because when people are in crisis, that's when they're really dangerous. If their belly's full, <laughs> they're happy. Then they are not dangerous. But when you're weak and hungry, you will do many bad things. <laughs> okay, so for all those people who think that uh, we're going to be friends after we get rid of government and the whole thing collapses and finally we're free of taxation and all that stuff, think again. We're going to replace one evil with a much greater evil, and that's going to be starvation. And during starvation, people do, what did you say, dangerous things, okay? We're going to be killing each other. We're going to eat, be eating each other. First, we're going to eat whatever's out there. All mammals will disappear. Forget it. There's not that ma many mammals out there to feed us anyways, but I'm sure someone's going to take care of those. Uh, some people say, well, how about the lost tribes out there? You know, they're going to survive because they're not part of our economic system. These people have mental problems. That's what I say. You know, I mean, uh, or either they don't do any research or they don't have a capacity for reasoning. The lost tribes are the first that are going to die. They're the first to go. Okay, uh, why is that? Well, because there are no lost tribes to begin with. You know, we have these satellites, unless you believe in the flat earth, okay? We have these satellites, um, and they can locate a matchbox in the middle of the jungle. You know, nobody's lost on the planet anymore. We found everybody. Everybody's found. Uh, lost and found, everybody's found. And whoever's out there, we know where they are. And when you're desperate, you're hungry, and, you know, a lot of people are just going to be thinking, I'm going to go to that island and do some justice, <laughs> uh, like feed myself, okay? And you might go there to feed yourself on the animals first, and when that's over, well, then you're going to fight, have to fight the engines, the natives. And you're probably going to be in better situation than they are. You're probably going to have a gun. You probably even know that the world's coming to an end, whereas they don't. Uh, you know, in fact, there's an island uh, a couple years ago, um, uh, in, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's managed by India. And they have to protect the natives there because people go down there any now, every now and then, especially um, priests and so on. They want to convert the uh, Indians. And the Indians just kill them. Whoever comes to the island, they kill them because they, they're they very hostile. Okay, And they want to keep their island free of visitors. And the Indian uh, government protects them. They protect them because they say, look, we want to keep these people like they are. They, they live in peace there, etc. Well, imagine when the government ceases to exist. You know, that island's going to be overrun. 
and the natives there are going to be, you know, roasted, you know, in the, in the fire. So forget about uh, Amish. The Amish are going to be the first to go. You know, Mennonites and Amish, because right now they have protection. Who protects them? Well, for example, in the United States, you have, you know, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, all that area. It's full of Amish. And they have this protection from whom? Do they have weapons or they have cannons and ways of defending themselves? No. The U.S. government protects them. Okay? And, uh, and the law protects them. So they have both military, physical protection, police, etc. And on the other hand, they also have legal protection. Well, when government's gone, all that's gone. And here they have these great farms, these beautiful farms, and no weapons to defend themselves. In fact, they don't believe in defending themselves. They don't believe in violence. And they probably don't even know what's going on outside their walls. Maybe they do. I, I don't know. But whether they believe what's going on out there, they don't, they don't care about all that stuff anyway. So people are just going to overrun their farms and kill every Amish alive. They're going to skin them alive, okay? So forget it. The Amish are going to need protection, you know, like you need protection, like Al Capone would say. You need protection. And there's going to be no protection if government's gone. So let's find out how government's going to be gone, okay? Here's the uh, chain of uh, money, okay? This is what runs our, our modern world, okay? Essentially, this is a snapshot. You have consumers. They receive salaries and they spend it in the market, uh, among other things, right? There's other stores, etc. but I'm just going to concentrate on the food because food, you know, if you don't have a computer, you can still breathe. Uh, we still have air that's not uh, being monopolized by anyone. It looks like it covers the entire planet, so we don't have a, to fear a lack of uh, air. Uh, water could be, maybe. Uh, market, for sure, if, because that's where you get your food, okay? And for sure, you cannot live without food, which is very strange in a sense because nobody has thought about food as a mechanism for extinction. We, we take food so much for granted. But, you know, how do we get food? Well, we spend money that we uh, got for the most part, right, from salaries and wages. So we go to the market. The market uh, asks the delivery guy to deliver more uh, food. The delivery guy gets it uh, typically from a manufacturer who packages it and, man and processes it or whatever. And the manufacturer gets it from the producer. That's the chain of, um, of food and the chain of money. See, all that's being held together by money. What happens when money disappears? Well, when that dollar or that euro or whatever disappears, that chain is broken. And now that chain doesn't work anymore. And so what happens? The consumer either has no money or he has money, but it's worthless. So he can't go to the market. Uh, the market won't sell it to him because what is he going to give the market? Uh, money, if money is no more. And uh, the delivery guy is going to request the same thing. He says, well, the market says, well, give me some deliveries. And the delivery guy, the transportation guy says, well, no, because you, what are you going to pay me with money? I mean, money is no more. Money is worthless. All you got is uh uh, confetti, <laughs> okay, that's all you got in your hand, and the manufacturer is not going to give it to the delivery guy, and then the producer is not going to give it to the manufacturer. Why will the producer produce if he cannot make any money? He cannot, um, um, he cannot have, um, what is it, um, um, what's the word, um, <laughs> uh, wealth, he, he cannot accumulate money, okay, uh, just a blank my head there. Anyways, uh, he can't make any profits. That's what I want to say. So if he doesn't have any profits because money is no more, why is the producer going to produce and give it to the manufacturer and to the deliverer and to the market? That whole thing falls apart. Hopefully you can understand that. We're assuming now, okay? We're, we're going to assume that money is no more. So far I haven't explained that, okay? I'm just saying if money is no more, that whole chain collapses. And if you don't understand that, I can't help you. <laughs> uh, give it a try. Go to the market, see if you can buy something without money. If, you, if they'll give you a carrot or a bag of potatoes, unless you give them money, some kind of money. Okay? And if money is no more, if money is no more, you have nothing to give them, and they will not accept your blank hands and say, look, we'll give, it, we'll give you food anyways, even though they, they do give out food for free in some places, okay? 
But in general, you know, you, you have to have money. You got to go out there and buy because that's what the guy's in business for to make a profit. Okay. So this is the issue. I hope you understand that much. Okay. Before you go all emotional on me and say, well, you're crazy. <laughs> okay. So let's keep that in mind. You got to have money. Without money, we're dead. Okay. That's the issue. Okay. And uh, so what happens if we have this scenario? Okay. We have the employed fewer and fewer employed and more and more unemployed okay, what do we use money for well we use money to pay salaries and that's where the whole thing starts we give salary to the employed guy and he goes out there and buys from the market etc etc right just like i explained just a minute ago but what happens when it's the uh blue team that has fewer and fewer uh members and more in the red team can we keep this up can we have 10% unemployment, 20%, 30, 40, 50% unemployment. Can we do that without the global economy crashing? Can we have increasing, increasing unemployment? So that's the first thing you should keep in mind. Okay, that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Um, this is the big picture. Okay, we've had for the last 10,000 years, you could say, because before that, we were all hunter-gatherers, essentially more hunter than gatherers. 100% uh, of our labor was dedicated to procuring food. That was it. We were just like any other animal in Eden. You know, all animals, what do they manage? I mean, every animal has an economy. Every animal is an economist. What he manages, because that's what economy is, management of resources. What is the resource that an animal, especially a wild animal, right, uh, manages? Well, he manages his food. That's all he's worried about. He's, he's got to fill his stomach the next day or in two days or in three days or in some amount of time. And so that's what we were for maybe 200,000 years or more, who knows. But then about 10,000 years ago, and again, these numbers are very general, so don't pin me on the numbers. They're just uh, in general so that you get the big picture. Uh, we started going into farming, okay? And farming is that green... Um, uh, block there and the hunter gathering sort of thing they started dying so the orange one which is the hunter gathering started dying and what is increasing now is the uh, farming we started going into farming first into subsistence farming and then eventually we went into commercial farming commercial farming brought in a new thing called manufacturing and probably some services as well right and some people started making, you know, maybe swords or spears or weapons or, or tools and they, or maybe furniture and they, or houses, right? And they started doing that and uh, they started specializing. And some people became strictly agriculturalists. More of them worked in agriculture, but there were fewer people who worked either as soldiers or as, um, or as builders of some kind. They, they, they did manufacturing of some kind, some rudimentary uh, manufacturing. Well, eventually, uh, agriculture became so uh, easy to do, especially at the turn of the uh, 19th century, from the 18th to the 19th century. That's when we went through the uh, Industrial Revolution. And so agriculture, we started introducing machines into agriculture, and agriculture became much easier to do, less uh, labor-intensive. So agriculture started to die and manufacturing started to increase. And we went like that at least till World War II. Okay, so all the way until World War II, we can see how that blue little block there, the manufacturing block, started growing at the expense of agriculture. But uh, I think it was 1979 and thereabouts, services overtook manufacturing as a percentage of GDP in some countries. I think um, Sweden was the first one. Uh, United States was among the first ones also, Europe in general. But around that time, you know, uh, services right after World War II started taking over and eventually caught up and surpassed manufacturing. Well, today, most countries, are the, this is global what you're seeing there, but some of the uh, most advanced countries which in, in a way are more important to, uh, to see because it's more relevant. Some of the most advanced nations, they have like 85% services and beyond, and only about 14% manufacturing and only 1% of agriculture. So even though those blocks don't show that at the end there, um, the service economy is much bigger 
in advanced nations. And then you have that block of unemployment. And uh, I made it big. You say, why did you make it so big? Well, I made it big because what's happened is we're having more unemployment in the world uh, as we go to the cities, as we move to the cities. And one of the big chunks of that unemployment, that black, that dark unemployment uh, block there, is that services uh, group. Services is masked unemployment. Services is unemployment, okay? Service is a promise, okay? Most services, at least, as far as I can tell, if not all of them, are just promises. You know, what? what is insurance? Insurance is a promise. There's nothing there. You know, if you had your eyes like God looking at the uh, planet from above, what do you see? Well, you see what's constructed. If you want to know if Germany is a wealthy nation, if Sweden is a wealthy nation, what do you look at? Well, you look at from the sky, you say, well, this is how much is constructed, and this is the standard of living, etc. And what is a standard of living? Goods. That's what you see. Okay? Now, uh, you don't see... Uh, the services. Services are things to be performed in the future. They're promises. And you can't see the services. You know, someone sings, that's a service. What did he give you? Nothing. Uh, you can't see the singing. <laughs> you can't see a barbering. You know, once he cuts your hair, that's it. And the next day, he's got to get another client. That's different than, uh, you know, manufacturing a computer or something solid like that, or food, which is also tangible. Those are things you can see from the sky. You can see, you know, the uh, factories. You can see the uh, buildings. You can see the ships, the airplanes. You can see the cotton fields. You can see all that stuff you can see. The, the visible stuff is the tangible stuff. The intangible stuff known as services, that's fake. That's a fake economy. And we're creating a lot of that more and more every day uh, through the Internet. We're headed in that direction when everybody just stays at home, does home office, and they do a little program or a little game or whatever they do and, or provide a service. The girls show themselves on YouTube. You know, there, there's all kinds of jobs out there today that, you know, can disappear in two seconds because we don't need them. It's a luxury economy. A service economy is a luxury economy. You pay for whatever service you want as long as you have the money, right? And, and so you just pay. And you want to see this? You pay. You want someone to cut your lawn? You pay. You want the barber to shave you or cut your hair? You pay. You don't do it yourself. And so we get into this luxury. We're all pharaohs. You know, we just pay for all our slaves to do stuff for us. You can't fix the electricity, no problem. Call the electrician. You can't fix the, uh, the water leak, call the plumber. You don't do all that stuff. You, you, what do you do? You do programming or whatever. So, so the issue is that uh, service economy is a luxury economy and it's an inexistent economy. And a lot of it is tourism. You know, uh, in fact, uh, one of the big things that happened with the COVID virus is tourism suffered tremendously. You know, hotels, do we need hotels? No, it, it's, it proved it there. We don't need hotels. We don't need restaurants. You can eat at home. That's luxury. You say, ah, oh, today I'm going to spend some money. I'm going to go to take the the frau, the, the girl, whatever, to the uh, restaurant. Or we're going to go on vacation, take a trip on the airplane, go to Hawaii and go to a hotel. You know, so we don't need all that. That's luxury. Okay, so uh, um, the, um, the um, service economy is a luxury economy. And it's an economy we don't need. That's different than Neanderthals needing to kill some animal to eat the next day. That you need. Otherwise, you don't survive. Services we can dispense with. And we showed here that even though about 10% of services disappeared around the world because of this uh, COVID thing, it's like, yeah, uh, we fixed it. We just gave everybody a little bit of money and uh, we continue going. But it means we did not need it, absolutely need it. In fact, uh, probably when uh, we come out of this thing, if, if we ever do, uh, people are going to do a lot of uh, home office. They're just going to work from their homes, and they won't need to travel by airplane to the meeting. They'll just do meetings through the Internet because they're just going to get used to that, just like we're going to be buying things through the Internet, etc. So, yeah, the new world uh, bodes terrible for, um, for real stuff. It's all going to be through the Internet, a lot of it, big percentage of it.
and all the and a lot of the jobs are going to be like that as well and what is that it's all fake jobs it's uh <laughs> how can i tell you that it's a fake job it is a fake job it's in you know a lot of uh, people will dispute that right especially the <laughs> narco caps the anarcho capitalists uh but let me keep going here um a lot of people say well if the uh, global economy collapses governments collapse money collapses no problem in fact it's good that's what they say it's good you say what do you mean it's good yeah it's good we get rid of government government's taxing us intervening in our transactions if we can get government off our backs man i can make my trade with with whoever i want and i have all the freedom to do so no longer will i be able to will i have to really have uh, this these eyes behind me staring at me saying hey you need to give me 10 percent of that you know mafia <laughs> it's called government it's mafia yeah government goes out there with a tax collector and a gun behind it you know, tax collector comes in nice you don't you don't give him the money uh the guy behind him with a gun he takes you to prison kills you or whatever you know steals it from you so yeah government uh, people especially today they they resent government they say oh government we got to get rid of government yeah but when you get rid of government you got rid of money that's essentially what getting rid of government means because government produces money okay and uh government regulates money and yeah you, there's a lot of arguments that you can weasel a lot of that but uh, well i'm not going to get into all those little details today but what i'm saying is government collapses money collapses there is no more money okay aside from the fact that a lot of uh, utilities um, are government run in different countries of the world and so that's going to be a problem because suddenly you don't have any water or electricity if government collapses okay and that might also be a domino effect where some poorer countries fall first then the next poor then get to the richer countries and finally the whole thing collapses okay so uh, the question is, did, uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, I'm going to do some bartering or whatever with my neighbor and we're just going to be fine. We're going to be great without government. Well, uh, and a lot of these people believe <laughs> that the Neanderthals, you know, traded with us and they have all these theories out there. And some people get that from there. They say, well, you know, we traded all along, you know, we, we, we traded with the Neanderthals and so on. And. If, uh, if you go to some of these paleontologists, so-called paleontologists, they say, yeah, we, we've proven that. We found some uh, seashells uh, that shouldn't have been in France, and we found them there. So obviously they were carrying these seashells all the way from Spain to France, and that means that they traded them. They, they used it as a bartering chain, as money. That's what they're saying. And so, yeah, what can I say? Um, here's a... Uh, Here's bartering uh, the Neanderthal way. Yeah, the guy goes out there and uh, trades his wife for maybe the uh, uh, the mammoth and, and his wife. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think this ever happened. There was no trade in those days. I cannot imagine someone doing the service, the mediator saying, Hey, Joe, you stay in your cave, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to get the buffalo for you. Are you gonna hunt it? No, no. Joey's gonna. Uh, Johnny's gonna hunt the buffalo. He's gonna sell it to me, and I'm gonna sell it to you. I'm gonna bring it here, and you give me. I don't know some tools. Uh, your wife maybe for a day. Uh, is this what happened? Is this how it uh, was? There trade? Are these people kidding me? These people don't know anything. <laughs> and and this comes from paleontologists. You got a famous one, John Hawks, who t says this nonsense. Okay. No, uh, this is this is what the trade. This is when you trade with a Neanderthal. This is what you're going to get. And if you trade with one today in, or in the future, this is what you can expect. Okay, this is how a Neanderthal trades with you. Okay, so if uh, if you go in there for the trade, uh, you better be ready <laughs> for something else. You're going to be trading your life in the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, that in a nutshell is what I propose. Uh, one of these days, when I have the time, I'm going to go into more detail and explain why money is going to be why money is going to disappear, which is what a lot of people want to hear. What the process is, and before I can get to that, I need extinction 101. And people don't want to do extinction 101 because they know nothing about extinction 101. They want to do extinction 102. They just want to talk about man because everybody's an expert in economics out there. Everyone. 
and so you can't even talk to them because they're all expert they know economics like the back of their hand they know exactly what's going to happen and why the government's wrong and why they're producing too much money and why the interest rate is too high and the job market is so low they know everything but they know nothing about extinction and so i need for someone to tell me something about extinction because what i'm saying is that if money disappears and money is not the issue the issue is food because with money we produce food money uh, food produces it's uh, you plant money and that's what what comes out is the potato if you don't plant that that dollar <laughs> no potato okay and you can say well i've got my own garden well again you got your garden but you don't have any protection you need protection uh donny uh he says so you need you need protection <laughs> Al Capone, he needs. He tells you you need protection. If you don't have protection, and you say, "Well, I have a Colt 45 and who knows a Smith Wesson," you're going to have to have a lot of bullets because you're going to be fighting a lot of people coming into your to share your bounty. <laughs> and you can't go out there hunting because everybody's going to be hunting, and some people will be hunting people. <laughs> so, be ready for a big problem like. Uh, uh, Freeman said, Martin Freeman said, or, or the lady there who told him says, when you're hungry, you're desperate. And when you're desperate, you do very weird things. Okay.